everyone, and welcome to a special documentary edition of Chris's Chaos. I am your host, Chris Cortez. Today, we are going to review, provide a little reaction to the new documentary, Bray Wyatt, Becoming Immortal. It was released today on Peacock, April 1st, 2024. So a very good documentary right off the bat. It's a great documentary. I knew it would be as I, I knew it would be and should be. It contains many interviews, footage never shown before, and uh, even costume creations never seen before from the WWE. And speaking of costume creations, we really get to meet and learn a lot about a very close friend of Bray Wyatt, a des his designer, essentially talking about Jason Baker. So we see a lot of a lot of input feedback, a lot of information we get from this man, Jason Baker, who is, in fact, a very, very close friend of Bray Wyatt. Jason already talked about how he was essentially Bray. Bray was his best friend, Wyndham Rotunda. So we see interviews from his father, his mother, his sister, his brother, his wife, Jojo, his ex-wife, Samantha. We're going to even, you know, get to peek into the lives of his children. This was a very, very in-depth documentary uh, that I think you're going to want to see uh, for, for many reasons. And we're going to get into that. Uh, so it, it, it was, it's, it's heralded under Peacock as the true story of Bray Wyatt's rise to worldwide fame as a superstar and the struggles and successes that came with being a creative visionary. Creative visionary is essentially what he was. And when you talk about being creative, an art form, being able to demonstrate what it is you're trying to do in, in, in a performance, in a performance art in pro wrestling, okay? Something that people, quite frankly, just don't understand. Uh, this was a good documentary to show you what, what pro, pro, professional wrestling can do from a creative standpoint and how Bray was able to make his character and his stories essentially like real movies. And, and, and we'll hear from certain wrestlers say that, well, you know, it was almost as if it didn't belong in, in wrestling, but it, but it, it worked. Well, that's because wrestling as a performative art is capable of reaching that type of movie, reaching movie, uh, like effects. Okay. Uh, impacting and getting feelings out of the viewers the same way movies would. They just have to be really, really good. They have to be really good and they have to be, uh, quite frankly, just, a cool cool is just the best way to describe it and bray wyatt the character was very cool okay uh, if you if you were into him if you've ever been into movies like cape fear if you've ever been into movies like anything from say like silence of the lambs or uh movies involving cults movies like uh, house of a thousand corpses devil's rejects you would know, okay, this, I get it. This is, I get why this is appealing. This key is coming from the mind of someone who embraced horror films, scary movies, fun, creative, artistic, wild, you know, outside the box type thinking movies. That's who he was. So we will get into that. Um, this is rated TV 14 for language. You get visuals. I mean, nothing too wild. Not, he wasn't, you know, not as very, uh, very, Contain. I'm surprised it's, it's maybe because of the fact that it is a tragedy and that, yes, he was a horror visionary that, yes, maybe it was fit for it to be TV 14. But as far as taste goes, very tasteful documentary, um, very appropriate for what it was, very heartwarming. You it couldn't have been a, a better, you know, more loving uh, person is Bray Wyatt. The, the love that you're going to see in this documentary coming from this guy just goes to show how how down to earth he was. Uh, he was loved by the audience and he loved the audience. He was loved by his, his colleagues and his family and his family and colleagues. I mean, he loved his family. It's so obvious. He just happened to be a really cool dude who had a really good uh, vision for horror and, and, and scary stuff, you know, much like Alice Cooper, you know, uh, much like Rob Zombie. Um, and it's the type of, it's or even a Tim Burton. He's up there, like, yeah, he he was, but he was he, he was a pro wrestler. So we're gonna get we're gonna get into that, and it really does break down a lot of great stuff. 
it begins with a shot of the Pittsburgh skyline. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, hmm, how is he related to Pittsburgh? I mean, my wife is from Pittsburgh and I see it and I recognize that, that one of the, uh, the, decl the incline, uh, the decline elevator, it's like a trolley that goes down from the hill. Uh, I know people from Pittsburgh are gonna be like, it's called this. And, but it, it really did show this, the, you can tell that they want us to see something going on here. And it cuts to a studio that Wyndham Rotunda, you know, it, it's it's essentially the studio of Jason Baker of Wyndham Rotunda. This is this is the where the real creative masterpiece was being put into was being materialized was being materialized, and it starts with Bo Dallas uh, or uh, you know Taylor Rotunda, uh, rightly so, um, and he states that you know so, uh, someone told me that wrestling is not a love story. It's hope. It's an excuse to be a child again, and nothing matters except the moment we are in. And the great man that told me this is my brother, uh, Wyndham, Wyndham Rotunda. So, and it is kind of the best way to describe one of the best ways to describe what wrestling is. It's, it's, it's an excuse to be a child again. It's entertainment. Okay. If you're going, if you're, if you're going to perform when you are performing something, you are, it is a chance to hold on to something, your imagination. Okay. And that's what it is. It's an imagination. Um, not many places, can you be both athletic and, you know, and be performative unless like you go into acting or, or like Hollywood and uh, plays Broadway, you know, um, Disney on ice, maybe uh, monster truck. This is, the, this is one of the last bastions, not since the days of Buffalo bill, one of the last bastions of performative, you know, art in which you can be really right there in your face, live action, athletic, and at the same time, go completely out of the ordinary. And that's what we got with Bray Wyatt. Before Bray Wyatt, it was Undertaker, okay, as the face of fear. And rightly so, The Undertaker is the uh, is essentially narrating this documentary um, from, you know, from a studio. And it's so fitting because he really was the next face of fear. It was Bray Wyatt. People may argue not, but here we are with Undertaker literally covering his documentary with, you know, a sense of pride and honor. Okay. Before Undertaker. Okay. And th there were people, I mean, maybe not as supernatural as, as Undertaker, but I mean, you want to talk about a phenomenal person, larger than life, think no further than Andre the Giant. Okay. The Giant was essentially the phenom. He was someone that probably scared the pants out of more people than ever. Uh, and rightly so. Um, and then you got a guy like Papa Shango, um, Waylon Mercy. We're going to see all these characters kind of come to light and influence the characters, the character and characters of Bray Wyatt by Wyndham Rotunda. So we, we get a statement from John Cena. We got, you know, staying at Bray, Bray Wyatt was chaos. That is a good way to describe him. He was full of ideas. And sometimes none of these, uh, not all of these ideas could get on paper. Okay. That's a theme going on here. Is this, 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 this kind of or conflict, rather, this ability to grasp what the, all your ideas, all these great ideas that you have in your mind and being able to put them on paper. That is the hardest part of probably the art, an artist is applying the, the, what you have in your mind to, what is on paper. And it is very frustrating. I can totally relate. I'm sure many of us can relate to that because you have a vision in your head and you don't know how to put it into, um, into substance without, without having the resources, the time, and of course, being able to plan it out. You have to have people on your side. On top of that, you have to have others that are on you, on board with you and say, yes, I totally get what's going on and we can do this. But rather we will see that there were times when they were like, well, we're on this idea and we don't know where to go from here. Um, how do we get from point A to point B? Or sorry, because I'm, I'm hearing you're at point D. How do we get from point A to point C or D? So Bray Wyatt was chaos. Okay. So I love that um, for obvious reasons. You really get to see the artwork design. I mean, it's, it, it shows. And essentially, I think towards the end of his career, he was able to kind of put more order to his chaos with his artwork, I think that was a great step. He met a certain. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some some people in staff that you could tell he was working well with later down the road, and that they were understanding 
And of course, Triple H completely, just a great, you could see how supportive Triple H was of Bray Wyatt. Uh, and giving him the opportunities that he gave him. I mean, it's, it's all there. So, and we will, we will get into that as well. Um, it focuses on the, we cut to, uh, we, we go to these, we see all some of these designs. And of course, Jason Baker, very much for, he is responsible. He's the creator of these designs with alongside Bray Wyatt um, to put them into a model like and be able to wear them in costumes. We're talking about the Fiend. We're talking about the Uncle Howdy. We're talking about uh, essentially all of the, the, the Firefly Funhouse stuff where he really got to explore his creativity. And that is pretty wild. And, and, and this documentary really does break down how awesome and amazing the Fiend character was. Uh, just essentially really explained it in a way which I even like couldn't quite. Yes. Like I understood he was like the, he was the, the fiend, uh, this character, the second character of Bray Wyatt was essentially a, uh, a shift or, a, or a, just a second personality of Bray Wyatt. And he's, but he's coming from the mind of Bray Wyatt, which is being represented as the Firefly Fun, fun House. And the fact, so the Firefly Funhouse was technically, it was not real. It was, it was a vision into the mind of Bray Wyatt. That's something Bruce Pritchard stated. And it makes a lot of sense in that, you know, why else would he have a, I mean, we never, we never got an actual stage for the Firefly Funhouse. They never showed it like they would, you know, promos and like the old school days where we would go into like the, the Heartbreak Hotel or Piper's Pit. Um, no, this was all meta. It was all digital. It was all, you know, just in his mind, but, but being represented as a, a fun house, best way to describe it. It was, it was, it's amazing. Um, the length of depth, this, this, this guy was willing to go. And that's, you know, can only describe him as a kind of genius in his creativity that is there. Uh, so we, we go back though, to a 23 year old Wyndham Rotunda, um, cut to Brooksfield, Florida, he begins to talk about his family, uh, Black Jack and Mulligan, who is his grandfather, Barry and Kendall Wyndham, who are his uncles, and his father, Mike Rotunda, a.k.a. IRS. Remember IRS? Erwin R. Scheister. Okay? We get some promos of him. And we get Stephanie Rotunda, Wyndham's mother. We get scenes of WrestleMania 1, where Wyndham and, and Rotunda are competing as a tag team. If you don't know, this guy has got just as much heritage in, in the wrestling business as anyone that is ever, he's a third generation wrestler. So when you get to the third gen wrestlers, they are just, just, in, it's just enveloped in, in, in the business. Okay. It was that way for Randy Orton. It's been that way for uh, Natalia, uh, you know, and um, as well, of course, the rock, uh, you know, they get, or, or even, you know, any of the, like the Usos, Roman Reigns, these, these, these people are, are it is their life, their, their, the business. It is their business. Um, and you see a 23-year-old Wyndham Rotunda. I mean, the way he talks about his father with, with a sense of pride, his grandfather, his uncles. He is very young, <laughs> 23 years old. But he's, he's definitely, you can tell, he's got, he's got his name. In, he's, he's, he's very influenced. He's very, you can tell he's very, very much uh, delving into the, the business. He was, a, he was a, from, from a kid. We talk about his, his parents. He was in love with Beetlejuice, Ghostbusters, uh, read all the goosebumps at three. Um, you know, his brother, Taylor, Bo Dallas, as we know him, as most of you know, him, was born followed by Micah, their sister. Uh, seen his, I've seen pictures of him and his brother and his sister all together. And, you know, you could just tell there's a close knit family. And of course it shows here that his sister was looked up to his brother, her brother, same with Taylor, with, with, with Bo Dallas, you know, Taylor Rotunda, they looked up to their brother, like he was their hero, um, you know, th at three, uh, you know, and I can totally relate to these. If you, if you have siblings, you know, maybe you don't, uh, if you, if you have an uncle or a relative that, is close to age to you and you look up to them like they're larger than life. Uh, that's how you look at your older siblings. And this is very much no different, you know, to my experience and those that have older siblings, they, you know, they are larger than life. In this case, you know, their older brother is going to grow up to be a larger than life wrestling superstar. Here we go. Um, 
Now, Mike Rotunda, he was one of Jim Neidhart's friends. You know, of course, you know Jim, not Jim the Anvil Neidhart, the uh, brother-in-law of Brett the Hitman Hart, and Natalia, um, the the niece, the, the, the daughter of Jim Neidhart, the niece of Brett Hart, talks about her relationships with the Rotunda children when they were younger. And they like to brawl. They like to get, you know, rowdy. It's a rowdy bunch. Again, it's amazing. I didn't even know that the, they knew each other that at that age. Uh, think about that, you know how close the families are, how close he was probably to many of the people in his locker room. Okay. And you see, you will see pictures of Natalia uh, and Bray and it just makes sense. I mean, these people are very much family. Um, and then Undertaker talks about his, him sharing his, his, the ring with IRS. Wyndham recalls the match between Money Inc. and the Nasty Boys, which, you know, he remembers seeing his father and getting, you know, a, a face rub into the armpit of one of the nasty boys and wanting to get in the ring and fight f- with his dad. So as a kid. So then he talks about his time in football. Um, this is great. Uh, he ran a 4.840 uh, at his size, which he was probably looking at. I mean, first off, he wrestled as a heavyweight. So he probably weighed about easy, let's just say um, 230, maybe 250, you know, already, okay? Um, and running a 4840 at that size, anyone who's ever played football knows that a guy that big running at that size is going to, you know, steamroll you. Uh, and, uh, that's kind of what he was. I mean, he's an all state football player and he was a state champion as a heavyweight. Uh, can you ask for more for, for a guy to be built up as the next WWE superstar? I don't see it. Okay. Uh, Mike. Micah, uh, his, his sister, uh, talks about how he was a draw even in high school, uh, then plays football at a co- junior college. Okay, they talk about him playing for the College of Sequoias in uh, Salia, California, and being a all American offensive lineman, transferred to Troy University in Alabama to play the D1 football. Uh, fantastic. How hard, you know, Micah discusses, you know, this, this dream of playing for the Oakland Raiders and how, you know, being a D1 football player is like a job. We know it is. It is It is a job. Now more than ever, uh, people are getting paid vast sums of money to play college football and play, do college sports at the D1 level. Uh, it is pretty interesting. Um, I would have, I would have, I would have said, I've always thought of Bray Wyatt, even looking at him, I was like, he must have been like the biggest Badass uh, defensive lineman, like a tackle or a nose guard. Uh, I, he, I, yeah, I get it. I mean, he could be an offensive lineman, but I think he would have been perfect as a, a defensive tackle or nose guard that will rush you and get dirty and, and, and do all sorts of things to get to the quarterback and or run stopper. You know, would have been great. Um, so he also uh, talks about, uh, Wyndham does about the making, you know, they, they talk about, making these six hour drives back to Florida. Of course, again, the undertaker is narrating. So, so, so forgive me if I forget to mention that it is the undertaker that makes some of these states, some of these facts. Uh, Micah recalls her being walked down as a member of the homecoming court and how uh, Taylor Bodalis was unable to wrestle for, so wrestle for state uh, when, when Wyndham was going to be home. So let me break this down. Um, Wyndham would make trips back home to Florida from Alabama. And Taylor, when he was an undefeated heavyweight wrestler for high school, was more than likely going to win state. Um, he taught, he asked his brother to you know see him wrestle. He's like, well, I'm only going to be able to make it to your finals. That's the one I want to see. I know you're going to make it. Well, when uh, Taylor was injured. And so when he got home, after not being able to wrestle that finals match, uh, his brother just hugged him and said, you know, none of this shit matters. I mean, that's, really the best kind of reaction you can get and the best amount of support from someone, you know, um, that when you put so much heart into something that if, if you're unable to succeed, you have to remember that the effort and of course the, the love that you get from those that supported you is really what's what matters. And we'll see that. I think, I think it's almost a little foretelling, like foreshadowing of, of what was going on with Wyndham and his creativity and how, we can't say that it, everything, it was very much a tragedy um, at 36 to, to pass away when he was about to be in his prime. That was going to be his prime. Uh, nowadays, wrestlers, professional wrestlers, if they're managed, if, if, nowadays more than ever, pro wrestlers 
are hitting their prime in, in their mid thirties, I would say like between the mid thirties to like mid forties. Those are like prime years, not just because they're, they're still managed. If they can, if they can keep their body in check, their mind is now caught up to their bodies. Their bodies have like toned, like pretty much toned down, gotten what they, where they need to be. They're not like trying to be super jacked. I mean, you could see it with guys like Shawn Michaels, the undertaker, um, triple H you could see guys, um, hey, go to new Japan pro wrestling. Tetsuya Naito. He's 41 years old. He's, he's now running as he's, he's the, he's the, uh, IWGP champion. This is what I'm talking about. He was, uh, Wyndham was, was, was very much unfinished in, in what his, his work was going to do, but it doesn't matter because the love he receives from his audience, the love he receives from his, his fans and friends and family just shows that it, none of that really does mean shit. Um, and I say this, like the, it, it could be with any other documentary or story, a tragedy, you know, you might not be able to truly believe that, but it's in this case, it really is true. Um, because anyone who was that much into this, this character and who knew him, obviously I didn't know him and it's, you know, but it, you can see the, the love for his, for this guy. Um, if you were a real fan, you, you, you never let go of this guy. It didn't matter how many times he lost. It didn't matter if, if like he fell off for a moment. Anytime this guy came back, we were all ready to watch. Probably more so than before because we, he was back. And you could see it when he returned. Everybody was into it. And uh, those people that like get up and down and up and down like, oh, well, he never did this or he lost to that. They seem to be along for the ride every single time this guy came back. You guys were all waiting with bated breath. Um, so, yeah. You know, that's really the, the, the victory for this guy and the success of this guy is that he had ha, the whole world in his hands. He still, to the very end, had the world in his hands. One of the things that I noticed about this documentary, one of a, a nice piece of information was that Bo Dallas, Taylor Rotunda, was, was wrestling uh, professionally first. Uh, he was an FCW. He's the, I mean, and it makes sense if you followed, he was, one of the first, he was what, the second NXT champion. Um, he really did have that push. He was given opportunities at the, uh, you know, the developmental level before Wyndham could even, you know, make it there because he was still playing football and he still was very much invested in, in pro, in, in perhaps playing pro football, which is completely not out the question, but he was, he was done with, I think it shows. I mean, he ends up leaving Troy University. I think his, you know, he was not being placed at the forefront of the team. The team was not, he was not starting. Um, and if you can't start, you can't play, you can't show him what you got. So he knew he was done. He didn't want to do school anymore. He knew where he is, where he belonged is the business. Um, can't blame him. Okay. Kind of like Randy Orton, Randy Orton. He was, I mean, he, he left the military. What does he do? He goes and does what he's meant to do. It's in his blood to do. Okay. Same with Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes wanted to be a Hollywood star. Nah, nah, he belongs. He belongs in wrestling, right? <laughs> so same thing. Wyndham joins his brother. Uh, we get to, and, and it's interesting because they 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 start as a tag team, and it looked like they really were happy to be together. Uh, great stuff. Um, they start out just like everyone else. Bingo halls, FCW matches. You know that's the way to do it. Um, the Rotunda brothers were already tag champions, though they they did succeed at that point. Uh, they, they want to tag titles for FCW. Uh, Cena talks about Wyndham being a top level athlete, you know, having that top level, level athletic ability, but also being the only one to make everyone laugh all the time. So he had the character. The guy is just charismatic. He's built, he's, he's naturally built, but he's, he's very charismatic. Um, then we cut to the beginning of NXT uh, and not the NXT that I watched. Okay. Not the NXT that I cared for. This was probably, a time in wrestling in which me personally, I stopped really focusing on. I was very much focused on college. But on top of that, there was really nothing good enough for me to really be invested in. And I've heard this from other podcasters and other people that, that talk about wrestling. That, you know, this was really, I mean, people like, oh, I don't even watch wrestling anymore. This was a time period that when we get this NXT that um, a lot of people stopped watching. And I'm not talking about people that were like, oh, I stopped watching after the Attitude Era. I'm talking like this was a year that someone like me and someone like diehard fans, somebody that was so invested in the business, okay, were 
completely just jaded and completely just disheartened to see what was going on. Um, and this is a perfect example. You got guys who are being mentored by other wrestlers. Okay. Who are like, who are being told what to do and in a way that just does not make sense. I mean, this is the perfect example. You've got Daniel Bryan or Brian, hey, Brian Danielson. Okay. Who's at this point, just almost like a, what a decade into his, he's already been a ring of honor champion. He's like a decade into the business and he is being mentored by the Miz. Okay. Come on. You got um, Husky Harris being mentored by Dusty Rhodes or sorry, Cody Rhodes, which makes sense. But at the same time, they've got to, they've, they've, you, is, you can tell this is probably a Vince McMahon name and create creative call for this guy. He saw him. Oh, he's Husky. Oh, what, what, you know, what's, what's, uh, you know, oh boy, let's, let's come up with, um, something that, you know, sounds good with Husky. Oh, Husky Harris. Let's do that. You know? Um, and he talks about that being, you know, a time when he saw himself as a sad little boy. Um, and it is, I, I, you know, I'm just glad that I didn't have to see it. I'm glad I didn't see it because I, when I was, seeing Bray Wyatt come up with the Wyatt family, I was totally pumped and I didn't even rec- notice the crowd reaction saying things like Husky Harris, Husky Harris, uh, sh- you know, that sucks to be you guys that you had to witness that, that you had to keep that in, in your brain and not just give this guy a chance when it was time for him to show him what he, what he's been pretty much putting his whole life into and put his whole heart and soul into instead being like, Oh yeah. Like, do, do you really think he, that was his, that was his call to be called, Husky Harris. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. A uh, little bit of what alliteration, if I'm not mistaken, come on now at its worst. Uh, we see him with his wife, Samantha, the birth of their daughter. These are things that he does focus on. We see this kind of balance of life, you know, work life balance, the struggles of work life balance, because at this point, he still hasn't become Bray Wyatt, but he is definitely having, he's becoming the, you know, Wyndham Rotunda, the father. Uh, Triple H talks about the Harris character not working, wanted to bring him down to Florida, FCW. He knew, of course, Triple H knew who this guy was, who is, what his pedigree is. And I was like, let's bring him down. Let's, 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 let's repackage this guy. Okay. Uh, let's get it, keep him away from the boss. Okay. Bring him down to FCW. Uh, Taylor talks about Wyndham being all over the place with ideas and cuts to Waylon Mercy and De Niro from Cape Fury talks about how the name um, he talks. So, so this character is being created. And if you watch Way- a guy like Waylon Mercy and you watch De Niro from Cape Fury, of course, you get uh, exactly what Wyndham was going for with Bray Wyatt. And even the name uh, came from a guy from high school named Bray and cousins named Wyatt, Wyatt uh, a person from high school that was apparently, you know, athletic and, and, and kind of a wild guy. Um, again, makes sense. Dusty Rhodes, he was convinced they did have, in fact, something. Um, reaches out to Chris Chambers. Chris Chambers, former a creative executive, um, talks about being presented with the promo by Dusty and saying, you know, this guy's like a movie character. And he was. I mean, yes, that's the best way to describe it. The guy is out of this, like, just transcendent, okay? When you say it like that, where he's a movie character, he's transcendent. Um, more than a wrestler. You know what I mean? Like the, like the Undertaker is transcendent, okay? Got John Huber, a.k.a. Brody Lee, a.k.a. Luke Harper, um, joining Bray Wyatt. Of course, Taylor could not join because he was already Bo Dallas. Um, and we, we, we get the first promos being filmed in Florida at the Rotunda Home, 10 Acres. Did not know that. It's pretty awesome, though. You know, I think they had this whole studio, this whole lot, 10 Acres, where they could film swamps and, 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 you know, perfect, perfect setting for the promos for Bray Wyatt's character in the barn. Uh, and then we get to his de- developmental debut, July 11th, 2012. Um, we get Eric Rowan coming in. He's like, uh, being told he needs to wear a mask. He really just wants him to wear a mask. So he comes in with a bag of masks, pulls out the sheet mask, Bray's like, this is perfect. Okay. Um, Rowan talks about, listening to interviews of guys of guys on death row and why they think they're, you know, right in, in, in what they've done, even though they're pretty much so wrong about the beautiful stuff. Um, really psychological. Uh, so in other words, if, if, if it's not all I'm learning here is that 
Um, these guys were essentially doing psychoanalytical studies of real psychopaths, okay, to get an understanding of how they can build their characters. If that doesn't take dedication, I really don't know what does, okay? If you're not, it's clearly the amount of work going into these characters, and it showed. It showed from the very beginning. If you watch these promos back when I was, when he, they were about to make their debut, I did not, I did not watch NXT, the, the real NXT FCW at the time. Um, I was watching, I was back into wrestling though, that's for sure. And I see these first promo, second promo of the Wyatt family. First thing I, first time I didn't understand what the hell this was, but then I saw it again. I'm like, okay, I like the music. I see what's going on. It's this family. Okay. They're a cult. They're kind of like a cult. That was rejects. House of, House of a Thousand Corpses. I get it. If you don't under get it, understand it, then you clearly are out of touch, but I got it. And I was like, holy crap. What I also noticed was the amount of work put into the promos and the build. It's like, these guys are already developed and they're being shown and they're being presented. By the time they come out, it's going to be amazing. And sure enough, it was. Um, so Triple H talks about incorporating the lantern. You know, that was a great move. Great on Triple H and how like even making sure that it's at a certain point only to just show his face, but not too much. Perfect. Genius. Triple H. Summer of 2013, the arrival of the Wyatt family in, in, on the national screen. Knew it was going to be awesome, and it was. And anyone who tells me it wasn't is completely out of their minds. So, or kidding themselves. Taylor describes the event at this event at Madison Square Garden and a sea of fireflies lighting up the arena. And he states that, you know, you get this idea that everything uh, he is saying is true. Um, one of the things that, that we notice about Wyatt and that his audience kind of does kind of see there is truth behind what he says. Uh, Zane talks about Wyatt connecting with the audience, and there was. I mean, him giving the opportunity for, for the fans to light up their cell phones, turn on the flashlight, showed his ability to connect with the audience. Uh, there's a fan kissing Bray Wyatt. At one point, he's, when, when you see him signing autographs, you can see he's pretty much himself uh, and just a really cool and outgoing guy. Uh, can't be much more cooler than him. Uh, you can see it the way he treats his fans. Um, he's, I've seen it with few people. Kurt Angle is one of them. He's one of the night nice, when I met him, he's the cool, one of the coolest guys you will ever meet. Um, in terms of, you know, just being friendly, uh, to your fans. Uh, the rock is another one. I've seen it. Hogan is another one. For some reason, there are certain like people in the, in the business that just don't, they, maybe it's because they're, they're heels and they're trying to keep the distance. They're trying to maintain kayfabe. I don't know what it is, but certain ones have like this ability to, you know, really connect with their audience. And you see it with Bray. Um, one dude is literally kissing his hand and, you know, kind of weird. I get it. But it's funny. Bray's laughing and, you know, he's able to take a, a completely awkward moment and just roll with it and be cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> but this guy clearly was just amazed by, but it was, it was a complete fan. He's basically saying, this is probably my favorite wrestlers of all, of all time. And it shows, I mean, he's dressed up like him. It's, it's amazing. Um, 2018, Bray Wyatt is set to face The Undertaker. Undertaker stated that the match did more for me than I could ever imagine. He saved his confidence. By 2015, Bray was box office. This is, this is great to hear. I mean, and it's clear. Undertaker wouldn't be completely narrating this, this, this documentary if he didn't have so much, you know, so much respect for, for Bray Wyatt. Um, keep in mind, this WrestleMania was the year after he had lost to, to, to Brock Lesnar. And after that match, he had to go into an ambulance and be taken to the hospital. It's no joke. Undertaker's last match prior to Bray Wyatt was, was like a good match. It was a, it was a cool match for the most part. I mean, I'm not going to say it was one of the best, but most people probably say it wasn't that great, whatever. But the sadness is that he was really injured that night where he, the streak ended. Meanwhile, prior to that, CM Punk gave him a hell of a match, put him up to, you know, and of course we will see um, a great match between uh, between uh, him and uh, AJ Styles that I loved. Um, Bray's one of those people that gave The Undertaker, you know, a sense of confidence. Best way to put it. Love it. Um, we get Braun Strowman. Now he talks about Bray's teaching, like being able to teach him about living in the business. Um, that's, again... Makes, you know, a lot of sense. Um, Braun Strowman was very green when he showed up, but he was definitely the type of guy 
that the business wants, you know, in as quickly as possible. So, you know, much like Paul White, you know, once he showed up, he was green, but he was, you know, the boys, they wanted to make sure that he was built up and, and uh, you know, taught as much as he could have been taught. So that's great. Becky Lynch talks about the warmth and humility when you talk to, to Wyndham. You get to WrestleMania 32 and how The Rock was basically acknowledging him. Then Wyatt um, won the WWE title, uh, you know, right before WrestleMania 33. It was so apparent that this guy was the, you know, the guy um, next to only a handful of people. People that are still like doing the the thing. They're still leading the, the parade right now as we speak. Guys like Seth Rollins, guys like Roman Reigns. You know, at the time, AJ Styles and Cena were still in it and they still are in it. I mean, AJ is still, he's going to have a feud with LA Knight, uh, you know, Wyatt's last rest, you know, opponent. Um, these are guys like Dean Ambrose, you know, AKA uh, John Moxley. These are guys that are leading the parade. You may or may not believe it or want to believe it, but that's what's going on. Um, the Shield is running shop, okay? And I think that Bray was supposed to be right there with them. Um, he was just a little bit under in that terms, but it's clear from the fans that he was the guy. So it doesn't matter what really what you think. We just have to look at that reaction from the audience, the way he kind of, you know, made surreal moments. Um, so, but at some point we hear about him and his wife, they're, they're drifting apart, leading up to a divorce. We cut to him working on promos and Bray getting frustrated. So now he's getting frustrated both work wise and his, his personal life's kind of, crumbling a little bit. So he's been put in a neutral position. It makes me think about, you know, him losing the, the, the WrestleMania 33 championship, the WWE championship at 33. Was it really a good idea? Hell no. Okay. Considering, I mean, love Orton, but think about it. Not only did Orton was not in the place to be like taking the, you know, the ball and running with it. Who did he drop the ball to after that? Um, if you can remember, uh, my God, Jinder Mahal, what a flop that was. And, how essentially it just had to go back to, I don't even know what John, not John Moxley, but I believe AJ Styles. Yes. Styles. Whole time. It could have been stay. It could have been kept with, with Wyndham Rotunda. He could have had feuds with, with, with uh, Shinsuke Nakamura, with AJ Styles. He could have had a, a whole, just a whole slew of, of feuds with good, with, you know, good wrestlers. And I really think that the next phase in his career was to make him a face. That's it. I will never, you will never be able to like, beat my claim on that unless you have something better. Um, he was totally ready to be a face. It was, you know, the undertaker, it took him up a roughly, uh, about, um, two years. Uh, let's say I'm looking, I'm thinking about it now. I'm thinking about it right now. Um, let's say a seven to eight. Yeah. About two years for the undertaker to go from like heel to face more than enough time to make Wyatt the face. He was a face, okay? Um, and he's in a neutral position. We get cut to, I mean, they don't really show much of WrestleMania 34, but I can talk about it. Third, WrestleMania 34, he's, he's tag teaming with Matt Hardy, winning tag team champions. He is kind of a face, but it's not the face that we're, we're talking about. The face I'm talking about is him with tag team with Roman Reigns at the main event of a Monday Night Raw, okay? That's the type of like face I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about a face that like he gets beaten, set, put underground, supernaturally comes back in a sort of way and wins, you know, comes back, beats the bad guy. We never got that. We got like weird, you know, mis mixed up ways of that. Um, and I was surprised that it never, it never co quite came right. Um, so can you see moments of his, of his frustrations? Um, Taylor talks about how Wyndham could have fallen apart, but, you know, kept on, held on to his creativity. Uh, Braun talks about just family, you know, being it family with the family, you know, being family with the boys and, and the people in the locker room, the girls, you know, the family outside of the family. Of course, we go to Jojo Offerman, how their friendship blossomed into a relationship. We all know uh, Taylor talks about their, you know, love for each other, uh, the birth of their son, the little girl. Um, again, this is, so obvious how close these two were. So um, it's great. I mean, it's, it's the way they support each other, you know, um, 
through it all. It's so obvious. Uh, early 2019, Wyndham begins to work on a character, The Fiend. Uh, he was sent home, had a creative, had nothing, creative had nothing for him. He had to do something drastic. So he calls Jason Baker at 2 a.m. and says, I got something. So they get, we, you know, then we get the interviews we had not seen before. He talks about the feud between Papa Shango and Warrior. Makes perfect sense. Probably one of Warrior's best feuds is with, I would say, you know, the feud with, with Macho Man Randy Savage, the feuds with uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, Papa Shango. Yeah, that's, this is the best stuff with, well, obviously with Hulk Hogan, WrestleMania 6 is great, but, um, and of course, Rick Rude. But nobody talks too much about the Papa Shango feud that kind of just fell flat, even though the build was very intriguing. Okay, because here's a guy, Papa Shango, just kind of has this voodoo character putting hexes and spells on Warrior. And Warrior's like, at one point, you know, he's, he's like, he's got like this ooze coming from his head. And you're like, what's going on with this guy? A guy who's kind of like a superhero being, you know, taken out of his element. That's fascinating. Um, so I see why Bray was um, influenced at that point. Uh, and he talks about how wrestling needs this dark story. There always needs to be kind of a dark character in wrestling. He's right. Um, wrestling's performance. It's, uh, it's sports entertainment. It's performance. So if it's performance, it take, it's, tells stories. It's literature. It's fiction. It's fiction at this point. When you get to fiction, you're going to get to romance, gothic, Scare horror is is just it, 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 it's a necessary part of storytelling. Okay, sorry if I have to explain it in a way which lectures you. But the, hey, if you haven't broken it, it, it's if it has it needs to be broken down at this point. Um, and I agree one hundred percent that wrestling needs a dark story. As kids, the rotunda of boys were enthralled with Stephen King and horror films. The ability to make what seemed Seems good, okay, actually evil. What seems evil into good. Just kind of mixing up the conflicts, you know, breaking the, the lines between what appears or what does not appear to be good and evil. Um, contrast between light and dark. Great stuff. Bruce Pr Pritchard discussed the Firefly Funhouse at this point as a figment of Wyatt's imagination. Wyndham's characters all represented parts of Rotunda's career. Um, great. Clearly, Pritchard was involved, very much so, and I see it, and you see it in the in the, in the, in the documentary and he clearly got it. Okay. So for some people who didn't get it, <clears throat> Vince McMahon, um, he clearly did get it. And even Vince, I'll give Vince, you know, some credit at this point, believe it or not. Um, clearly he was, he may not have gotten all of it, but he clearly got enough to give, uh, Wyndham Rotunda a lot of time to, uh, you know, spread his wings and a lot of, a lot of time, a lot of TV time. Um, Maybe more, maybe could have done with more. Um, of course, we get to, you know, the fiend being so over. We get to WrestleMania 34, a rematch with Cena. Cena describes the Firefly Fun match. There's this story. We can make it a meta journey. Great. I thought it was wild. I thought it was like something out of, uh, think no further than like Friday the 13th. Oh, sorry. Uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street. It was a lot like a Nightmare on Elm Street and the movie Shocker. The shock, like if you've seen that movie Shocker where, um, the main bad guy uh, makes a deal with the devil. He's a prisoner. He, and he gets it. He's also slash TV repairman. And he's able to go through TVs and electricity and basically take possession of people's bodies uh, and then kill them. It's ridiculous. But at one point, him and his you know, son are fighting each other throughout different channels, uh, different shows and TV. In TV land, it's a meta journey, if you will, um, is a fun way to describe it. But this ends with the bad guy winning and the fiend winning. I like that. Um, we all did. It was kind of like his revenge um, to beat John Cena. We cut to Alexa Bliss and how her character was created and how this was the best time in her career. You know, it's pretty obvious Alexa Bliss, uh, you know, she was brought up big because of, 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 of Winnie Rotunda's fiend character. Um, it was a big push for her. Uh, they clearly didn't had I, I did not know what to do with her, do with her at some points. Um, she was perfect for that role with her facial expressions, with her acting ability. You know, she's very athletic, um, and and I always thought she was good as a wrestler. Um, but that's not her strongest points. Her strongest points are her her ability to act and her ability to portray a character. Um, unfortunately. 
the character started to become bigger than 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 the fiend character. Um, but I don't think that's I mean, especially after this documentary. I I will say that you can see, you know, Wyndham Rotunda's, you know, involvement with with the business change. December twenty twenty, John Huber tra- uh, tragically passes away at forty one. So Brody Lee is gone. And we see Wyndham in tears. Uh, we get a video. I, I had not seen this. Wyndham is just in tears. I mean, he looks like, um, you know, kind of like he does when he was at the age of like 23. Uh, vulnerable, very vulnerable. Not being able to pro- process this tragedy. So it makes no se- It makes perfect sense as to why Alexa Bliss, for those that were like, oh, she's taking over the story. Well, probably makes sense at this point. Um, it's sad though. It was sad. Uh, because we clearly know how over The Fiend was. Um, but it's sad. They stated that no one could fill this void left behind, but I'll try. Uh, very sad. We then hear about the difficulties between Wyndham and the other writers. Nicholas Manfredini, a former WWE writer, talks about how Wyndham did not like when others tried to tell him how his character should act and speak. Uh, I would have agreed with Wyndham on that. Okay, it, But but what the wall of things Paul Levesque states is that you could describe him as a world of Wyndham as a whirlwind of ideas. And it was difficult to kind of get from to get everything on paper. That I understand. And I kind of feel bad. It's like, yes, you have to work with your, your colleagues to get your ideas out of your brain onto that piece of paper. But as far as acting and speaking, hmm, I would, I would tread lightly when you are trying to, you know, when you are trying to um, influence a character, a baby, you know, it's essentially, this is, you know, Wyndham Rotunda's baby. So tread lightly. Uh, but as far as the getting ideas out on paper, that stuff I understand. And that's, that's tough. So I could see, especially if so much come is coming from one guy, I could see why there would be difficulties between Wyndham and the other writers. Um, Orton discusses the Inferno match and how stressful that was and how uh, the burnt fiend and how much Wyndham hated the costume. I don't blame him. He did not. He looked so stiff in that costume. Jumped to WrestleMania 37 and and how his costume was like restored back, you know, to its original glory. And then, of course, Alexa Bliss turning on him and then losing the match. Now everyone was pissed. Guys, this was definitely the end of The Fiend. This was the worst, um, you know, thing that could have happened uh, to, to Bray Wyatt. Not like he already got his rematch, his revenge match against Cena at WrestleMania 34. It was only fair and only made more sense for him to beat Randy Orton, who had taken the title from him at WrestleMania 33, you know, and it also burnt him. But then you get Alexa Bliss. Like WWE really seems to like, at this point in in, in the business, they seem to try to hit this point that, oh, you don't always get your revenge. No, get, get, this is, this is it. I don't need you to teach me about life. Okay. That you don't get what you want always. Okay. This is story time. Okay. We, we get what we want because we're trying to have fun. Okay. At this point, otherwise, it doesn't make sense, especially if you have nowhere to go with the character, i.e. Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt had nowhere else to go. And we see her, Triple H knew it fell apart. It was not sure how it was happening there. That's how it's happening. You're you're completely just, you know, just deconstructing everything he's built. Sam Roberts discusses the events leading up to when him being released. JoJo shows us uh, his studio and where he could continue to focus on his creativity through his art. Now we see a painting of Uncle Howdy. Looks great. Uh, the documentary shows us the Rotunda brothers working on a pilot for Ghost Chasers show. Pretty cool. A, a Ghost Chasers type show. Like that's that's pretty cool. Um, and how he was. It was just great for them working together. But they were talking more and more about wrestling and coming back. Micah discusses him wanting to go back and tell more stories. He has more stories to tell. At 35, he's working out hard. Made his way back into the Performance Center. Working in the ring with Natalia and TJ. Uh, Bo Dallas, ready to come back. You know, then we get Rob Fee, or Rob, Rob Fee, or Fee. Sorry if I don't know how to pronounce, but he's a director of content. I mean, you could tell very enthusiastic working with Bray Wyatt. Uh, and that, of course, leads to the White Rabbits QSR codes that we were getting. Um, felt like Bray was not sure, which really suggested we, we, we didn't know if it was Bray Wyatt at, at the time, but we kind of knew, which only told us that it's something very new and exciting. And I love that. Um, Anytime this guy came back, everybody was like pretty much invested. I should tell you something. Drawing and painting was just how he kept calm, he says. He was so pressured about doing something right. Um, ah, 
Jason was in the fiend costume. Uh, we get, when he returns and 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 all those. If you if you saw the the ple um, where he came back, it was uh, uh, extreme rules. <sighs> all these previous characters that designed by by Wyndham Rotunda were, were making appearances, and the fiend was dressed up by J, you know, Jason Baker, the, the designer, was the only one that he felt comfortable putting him in the fiend. It's pretty cool. Pretty uh, you know. Pretty big honor. Um, here's the thing. The word nervous is mentioned significantly uh, and just wanting to make sure everything works. That's the type of stuff that's for me foreshadowing like how much stress he's putting on his body internally. Okay. I feel bad. Um, and that's what, you know, what it's like to be too, like so passionate, you know. Um, but nobody could really see it coming, you know, um, that he was, he was old because he was always, he was, he was in a lot of ways, their, their superhero, um, those closest to him. So they didn't think that there was anything wrong. And naturally, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Nobody did. If anything, we thought, okay, to me personally, and anyone else will tell you, uh, yeah, this is kind of it. Like he's about to be the guy. Um, and nobody understood why he was, he was missing, but we get to this door, the new mask, the whole, just a bunch of, you know, Holy shits, mask being taken off. Everybody's going crazy. Um, he says, I don't think I ever felt anything like that. I just feel like I was just in a car wreck. Triple H saying we're going to make this bigger than anything else. Taylor talks about the jacket and bringing a spark back to him, all thanks to Wyndham. Um, get, get to do the promo in the ring. He's talking about like the Uncle Howdy stuff. This really was like kind of the moment. We got like fast forward to Bray Wyatt um, to what should have been like his second face run, real face run. Um, he's getting the, the fans approval and, and just acclamation um, for how great he is. Uh, I love that. And if you were watching it at the time, um, then you knew it was very much real. Jordan stated that he forgot how the fans loved him. He loved the fans. The fans loved him. It's just so obvious, um, especially at this program, the smack, uh, this, this promo, SmackDown, October 14th, 2022. I, I won't forget it. And it was it was one of the best Bray Wyatt promos you'll ever see because it was how genuine it was. Uh, Richard states Bray wanted to take him on a journey, one that showed uh, us he was like us, but not like us. Uh, he was going to bring in his brother uh, and this, this nightmare they had in his dreams, the Uncle Howdy character, being played by his brother, Taylor. Uh, this was his last goal. His job now was to play with his brother. Um, it's amazing uh, how Pritchard, Bruce Pritchard, is, is able to describe the aspirations, the goals, and the creative uh, insights of Bray Wyatt. Clearly, he was involved with Bray in a good way. Um, and I don't think everyone knew that, but it shows. Um, Triple H talks about how he had wanted to work this out and uh, as he worked, he was working with Bray. Taylor talking about being too good to be true. And unfortunately, kind of was. February 26, 2023, PLA, PLE that pitted LA Knight versus Bray Wyatt. Uh, they talked about Wyndham's knee not feeling right. And this was essentially the last match of Wyndham Rotunda. March 2023, Wyatt character absent. Everyone's wondering, oh no, is this just another, you know, creative issue thing going on? And anyone who was listening to podcasts knew, like, or thought that, Oh, he's being buried again, or, or you know, there's creative issues, and this is why rumors, all rumors, not knowing that he was he gets he has COVID, and his mother and, and Jojo point out how it affected his heart, how Wyndham continued to say something was off. The last moment of Wyndham Rotunda's life involved his sitter, sister spotting a rattlesnake in the garage, and then Taylor and, and Wyndham getting rid of the snake. Uh, Taylor noticed that that Wyndham was sweating, needed to lie down. We get Thursday, August twenty fourth. All the events leading up to this uh, cardiac arrest at the house. You know, Jojo was there. His, her mother was there. Tears falling from her eyes as she describes what was going on, as well as Bray Wyatt's, you know, Wyndham Rotunda's mother describing it. Uh, it's this, and then, and then of course, Taylor describing it as something out of a movie. But you don't know what it feels like until it happens. Um, and I thought it was so sad, but felt a need to keep it together. Absolute disbelief. We got Mike Rotunda, Barry, Braun. All these people in tears. Bron states, I felt like something was missing for me. 
And uh, it was a nightmare, but you don't know what it was like until you have lived it. Um, passed away at 36 years old. 36 years old. Um, and yeah, this was, you know, very heart, you know, just it's, it's, it's very heartbreak, heartbreaking. Um, uh, very much you, if you have dealt with it, you know, a tragedy like this, then you totally relate. You totally do. Okay. Um, you know, family members, if you have, if you have had a, you know, a family member that has passed away, you know, my prayers go out to you. Of course, it's the worst. And you don't know what it's like until it happens. Um, whether it be a grandmother, you know, a father, a daughter, or sorry, a mother. <laughs> now, to anyone who's ever lost a sibling, you know, myself included, um, especially at such a young age, um, that's the one you know is, it's, you know, and it's not to take away, it's, it's really not, you know, um, it's, it's, it's because it's, it's, it's completely out of nowhere. It really is. It's tragedy is, is the best way to describe it. Um, when someone is taken away from us way too young, who has not completed all, all that they could complete, that isn't like, you know, ready to go out, at least in our eyes. And it is a nightmare. Um, that is the best way to describe it. And you don't know what it feels like until you do. Um, we jumped to SmackDown Triple H, and we will talk about that more, obviously, because I, I really feel, you know, really um, connected to the, you know, what Taylor was saying, you know, Bo Dallas, he couldn't have done a better job on this. Um, everyone that was involved in this documentary couldn't have done a better job. I couldn't have showed, like, opened up to us better than they did. And everything you could tell was very genuine. Um, up to Triple H. Triple H explained to the locker room, the staff, how life is just short. He keeps kept saying it, and you see it like life is short. Bray's gone, um, and it's just it's not you know it's just unreal. And he just feels like he's just gone for like like he's gone for a while, but he'll be back. Uh, Sami Zayn still feeling that sense of total denial. Rollins, Seth Rollins thought it was told just not real, total bullshit. Can't believe it. Pritchard saying that everything we went. Uh, we wanted to do in tribute to Bray that, you know, was for Bray that night. We're going to do a big tribute. Uh, Eric Rowan, Alexa Bliss, they went, you know, they're crying. His father stating he was loved by millions. Oh, he's in tears. LA Knight, Becky Lynch. Seth Rollins paying tribute to Wyndham in front of the crowd. <sighs> and um, September 6, 2023, Brooksfield, Florida. This was just, I'm definitely, you know, hit home. The funeral became, it was, it was, if you see, they showed clips of the funeral and, and there was a lot of red, uh, really dark, kind of like just that theme of supernatural spookiness, Stephen King-like stuff, you know, John Carpenter's type stuff that Bray just encapsulated, you know, the true face of fear. And they said, oh, this is a Wyndham funeral. And like, yeah, it was. Orton stated something that really hit home um, that, you know, it was a... a after the funeral, you know, he states that you, we got some closure, but really how can there be closure when the guy was just stepping into his prime? And that's the truth. He really was just stepping into his prime. Um, and that is what you call a tragedy. That's what a tragedy is. There is no closure, full closure of a tragedy. That's why it's a tragedy. Um, and it's sad. But it reminds you of how important that person remains um, because otherwise it wouldn't be a tragedy. Back to Pittsburgh, Wyndham's final creation. The new Fiend costume and lantern. I love the way it looked. I thought it looked pretty badass. Um, kind of remind me of something um, that from the... <laughs> uh, I'm losing it. Batman, um, just the new Batman uh, artists that are working on... That worked on like the Joker. Uh, the one where like his face is... If you... If you um, uh, what you know, read enough comic books with, with, with some of the more recent stuff. Um, you know, the Joker at one point, his face is ripped off and then sewed back on, stretched out to give him this completely, you know, disturbing smile. Um, it's great. It's it was, it kind of reminds me of that. I just love the stitches and I didn't know, like they showed the lantern, the one with the fiend with the, with the Bray Wyatt face and his mouth open and the lights, there were stitches. I always noticed the, this, his eyes being sewn shut. Uh, very, you know, influential, like it very had a seriously weird effect on us. What I didn't know, and this makes it all the more awesome 
is that they were Roman numerals for his son son's birthday. Um, that's awesome. You jump to the new Bray uh, Fiend character, and he's got stitches in certain places in Roman numerals of his 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 wedding date with JoJo. Um, symbols like doves, which is like a representation of of JoJo. They even did a mask like imitation of her face and for the back. Could it be any more obvious that Bray Wyatt wanted to display his, you know, his relationship with JoJo in, in a positive light uh, and show how much, you know, how much love he had for, for the, for, for her and vice versa. Um, and we can see that uh, we, we do cut to beyond, you know, um, you know, just the, the creations. I mean, we talk about how Jason, Jason Baker will miss his friend, his best friend. Um, it's very sad. Uh, but we do get a sense of hope. Undertaker and Jojo describing how his kids, you know, they he will live on through his kids. Um, the fire that was given to him, Taylor says, um, gives giving him strength to carry on. Um, I understand that wholeheartedly. Um, being able to be strong, when you're totally not supposed to be and not because you want to be, um, but because you have to be, to be kind of keep things together. And it doesn't happen every time. Um, trust me, moments of tragedy, moments of you know problems. I fall into pieces. We all have, but then there are times when others are falling to pieces and you have to kind of be the rock for them. And it's pretty miraculous, really, where you, you know, fall apart, but then quickly pick yourself back up so that you may be able to keep things together for everyone else. So it's pretty amazing. The children, they all have a piece of him, his creativity, his spirit. One of them's just a dinosaur. Um, <laughs> smarts, the strength, pretty, pretty, pretty incredible. Cena describes Bray Wyatt as being the template for being brave. I agree. Thinking outside the box, doing what he felt was creativity, uh, doing what he felt he needed to do in a business where a lot of people in the upper levels are going to push you down and be like, yeah, no, you do what we tell you to do. Um, and this is what we want. And you're like a puppet to us. No, he had his ideas. He came completely designed and you could tell <laughs> probably no one's going to be able to mess with this guy. He's just too, he's, he's, he's like building, you know, machinations, these golems that are like, Monsters, work of art. You can't control the monster. You see this monster and you're amazed. You're just, you're so flabbergasted. You just want to get out of its way and help it move along. That's amazing to me. Uh, coming up with a complete, a completely new idea from yourself and then presenting it and moving forward with it with as least resistance as possible. Because anyone will tell you if you put your heart and soul into something, you really, you, you don't need things to be completely changed. You, you want them to remain. You can get certain, you know, things uh, to supplement it or, or like complement, but your baby is your baby. That's it. Um, until it's presented to the world. <sighs> so Cena, um, Again, we got Jojo stating that he was the greatest person she had ever known. That's pretty bold. That's a pretty incredible statement. You know, the greatest person she's ever known. Credits. We get to the credits, even Undertaker. You know, he pours himself a shot, pours a shot for, for Bray in honor, cheers the shot. Just an honor working on documentary and how he worked with Mike Rotunda, then meeting the kids, then working with Wyndham, going full circle. He was taken from us way too soon. He's just, I, because, and I know what he would have been. That's, that really says it all. I know what he would have been too. Okay. He would have been 
a next like immortalized superstar. That's really what it was. He was just on the cusp. And now he is. I mean, now he really is. And that's why this, this documentary is so fitting, becoming immortal, because he really was on the verge of becoming immortal anyways. Um, we do get to the credits with the original Bray Wyatt family music. It's the best it's the stuff I used to listen to. The con- you know, it's, anyone who knows, anyone who knows that song knows that it like is something that you can play whenever. Then you got the last image flickering TV flickers, almost very fiend like very Bray Wyatt like, and we get a lantern that flashes on and a character that really could only be uncle Howdy saying, uh, run post credit scene, much like a Marvel movie. Um, yeah. So who knows? Maybe we get an uncle Howdy character. And that was the documentary of Bray Wyatt becoming immortal. Um, great documentary. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was very creative, very just hit home, hit all its marks. I highly recommend you go see it. Peacock. Up there with the uh, American Nightmare, the, the, you know, which is just as good. If not, it's 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 really really good. Um, so Uncle Howdy, uh, for those fans that I. Very curious as to your thoughts on Uncle Howdy. Um, do you think he should come back? I don't know. Maybe appearances like Once in a Blue Moon, just to kind of pay tribute to to Bray and the story to keep it alive. I don't know if it's how 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 it would work on a continual basis. Um, because the mind of the gene, like the mind of the 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 mind of the master is pretty much gone. Um, really, what are they going to do? Uh, very cool. If they could pull it off, that, that would be awesome. Um, I just don't know what to do. Um, but Uncle Howdy, it would be nice to see him again. I would like to see him at least once. You know, Maybe he pops up with the LA Knight AJ Styles match. That would, that would make some sense. Maybe shakes hands with it, LA Knight, you know. You know, my bad for uh getting involved with your last match with my brother. Kind of move on from there. I don't know. God, it's been great. It's been a great time. Um I got one more video I will be putting up later this week. Previews and predictions for WrestleMania 40. And um I hope you guys have a wonderful time. It's been great. I know. Uh, well, got a lot going on, you know, we got a, you know, my wife and I planning to, to move that will, and this move will essentially change like just the face of our, of our lives. So yeah, a lot going on, <laughs> but I'll keep on doing some posts, podcasts. Um, it's been fun. As you can see, I'm clearly a little bit rusty. But I'll get back to the ball, you know, get back, get back, get the ball rolling again. Uh, and I'll have a wonderful time. Uh, please go enjoy that documentary and I will see you all next time. Take care.